Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in the playlist on inflammation and angiogenesis. In this video, what we're going to talk about is the acute inflammatory response, okay? And we're also going to talk about anti-inflammatories. Now, this is going to be a big video because what we're firstly going to talk about is the acute inflammatory response so that we can then discuss how the anti-inflammatories work. And I think it is really uh, necessary to discuss the acute inflammatory response before we can discuss how drugs work on it. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to understand properly. It's not going to piece together properly. Okay, so the acute inflammatory response and anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so um, what we're going to start with is I'm just going to start off with uh, explaining the difference between an anti-inflammatory drug and an immunosuppressant. Uh, then what we'll talk about is the acute inflammatory response, so we'll talk through it, and that will be the main bulk of what we're going to talk about. And then towards the end, what we'll then do is look at different drugs that act on the acute inflammatory response and act to stop it. Okay, so we'll see some very famous drugs, and then we'll see a few uh, rarer drugs. So what's nice about the anti-inflammatories are these are drugs that generally most people have actually heard of, or some of them are drugs that people have generally heard of. So we'll be doing the NZs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and these are drugs that you have probably taken within your lifetime. So things like ibuprofen, aspirin, uh, drugs like that. Okay, but we'll also see a bunch of other drugs like infliximab that unless you're very, very ill, you will never have taken. Right, okay, so uh, we'll start off with our discussion of uh, the difference between an anti-inflammatory drug and an immunosuppressant drug. So what is the difference between an anti-inflammatory and an immunosuppressant, because this video, we are not going to talk about any... Well, actually, that's untrue. Uh, we're going to talk about certain drugs which are both anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant, but we're only going to talk about them as anti-inflammatories. They're going to be specifically the glucocorticoids. Okay, uh, but uh, we're not actually going to talk about immunosuppressants in this video, and the reason is uh, that these two drugs are not the same... Uh, they're not the same type of drugs, okay? So anti-inflammatories are not necessarily immunosuppressants. So anti-inflammatories are drugs which stop the acute inflammatory response, okay? So they block the acute inflammatory response. And the acute inflammatory response is also often called the innate immune system or the innate immune response, okay? So acute inflammatory slash innate immune response is what these drugs are going to affect. And that's what we're going to discuss in this video. We're going to spend an incredibly long time discussing uh, what the innate immune response or the acute inflammatory response is. Um, and then we'll look at how the drugs affect it. Immunosuppressants, meanwhile, are scarier drugs. These are drugs which stop the adaptive immune response, okay? Uh, so we will do a whole video on the adaptive immune response and immunosuppressants, which will follow this video. And in that video, we'll talk about immunosuppressants. So these block the adaptive immune response, okay, which take is a longer, uh, so it takes a longer time to initiate the adaptive immune response than the acute inflammatory response, but the adaptive immune response is more powerful, okay, at clearing uh, pathogens. Okay, so that's the difference between anti-inflammatory drugs and immunosuppressants. However, there are certain drugs which can both uh, have anti-inflammatory effects and immunosuppressant effects, such as the glucocorticoids. So it's not like a drug is either an anti-inflammatory or an immunosuppressant. This is just meant to tell you that uh, there is a distinction between what an anti-inflammatory drug is and what an immunosuppressant drug is. Okay, right, um, and I'll just put an anti-inflammatory drugs there. Okay, to complete it. Right, okay, so let's now turn our attention to the acute inflammatory response then, and what happens in the acute inflammatory response. And then we'll come f eventually to how the anti-inflammatory drugs work and prevent this from 
uh, going on. Okay, so the acute inflammatory response then. So the acute inflammatory response starts with some sort of pathogen being present within your tissue. Okay, so this could be a bacterial cell, it could be a fungal cell, or it could be some protozoan, such as a protist, for instance, maybe uh, malaria could be an example, although malaria is generally intracellular, but of course it does have to be extracellular for some time. When the mosquito first bites you, the pathogen will be uh, extracellular. Okay, so um, here is our microbe in red here. Okay, I'm going to outline it in red and I'll just straighten up the page. Okay, so in red here, this is our pathogen and it could even be a virus potentially or some other protist. So it's just anything which is capable of causing disease, a pathogen, anything which is capable of generating a uh, pathology. Right, so it's some sort of microbe is a way, another way of covering all of those possibilities. Right, okay, now, uh, this is not good. We do not want a microbe within our tissue uh, because it, there's a risk that it will divide and divide and divide and then you'll have a whole population of microbes and these microbes will be competing with our, you know, our human cells for nutrients such as oxygen and glucose and we don't want that. That's not good. Uh, so we want to eradicate these microbes. It's far better to eradicate them than be kind to them and let them grow out of control, that's not good, that will result in the death of the human cells, okay, as they get out-competed. So, what we want to do is eradicate this pathogen. Now, how do we eradicate this pathogen? Well, basically, the peripheral tissues do not have the equipment necessary to destroy this pathogen. All of the troops, if you like, that are capable of destroying the pathogen, they are within the bloodstream. They are circulating within the bloodstream in inactive forms, okay? So, what we need to do is get troops out of the blood and into this interstitial fluid to fight this microbe or this pathogen, okay? So, the acute inflammatory response is all about this. It's about getting troops from the blood into the interstitial fluid to fight this pathogen. Okay, and it occurs very, very quickly. So, firstly, what has to begin is that you have to start uh, by detecting this pathogen. So, how do you detect the pathogen is the first question. So, within all of the tissues of your body, you have a population of cells which are known as sentinel cells. Okay, so dispersed among all the cells of your body, you have these sentinel cells. And there are three major types of sentinel cells that I want to outline. Okay, so the first is the dendritic cell. Okay, and these have absolutely nothing to do with neurons, even though uh, their structure looks slightly like the um, cell body portion of a neuron. Okay, with its dendrites coming off it here. Uh, and that's because it does look like the cell body of a neuron with its dendrites coming off it, but this is not an excitable cell. There is no way this can conduct an action potential. It simply does not have the voltage-gated channels that you need in order to conduct an action potential. So this is what's known as a dendritic cell, and it instead is involved in immune surveillance, basically. It stands on guard all the time and is waiting, waiting to see a pathogen. Okay. You also have other forms of sentinel cells, although the dendritic cells are one of the most important. Okay. Another form of cell that you have that's a, a doing this immunosurveillance as well is what's known as a resident macrophage. Okay. So macrophages are one of these cell types that is going to be brought in to fight uh, the pathogen. Uh, in the acute inflammatory response. However, you do have a few of them resident within your tissue all the time. Okay, so they're dotted around the place. Now, they are capable of actually phagocytosing the pathogen there and then, but of course they're so rare that unless there is actually literally just one pathogenic cell, then they're not really going to uh, be able to deal with this infection themselves. So they their real role is to call for help, basically, to be a sentinel cell. And that's really what sentinel cells are. They're cells which will spot pathogens and call for help, basically.
Okay, and then the final cell type that I want to discuss is what's known as a mast cell. Okay, so this is a mast cell. Okay, so mast cells, again, are dispersed around all the tissues of your body. So here is the nucleus of a mast cell. And they have, within their cytoplasm, these granules, okay, so vesicles, which are full of histamine. So let me put this in here. So I'll put little green dots to represent histamine. Okay, so these little green dots represent loads of histamine molecules within the mast cell. Okay, so these are what are known as the mast cell granules, or maybe even better, histamine granules would be good. Okay, so these free sentinel cell, cell types are dispersed around all the tissues of your body, and I'm sorry about putting the full stop after that histamine, never mind, uh, and um, they're dispersed all around your body, and they are standing guard, looking and waiting and watching for pathogens. Of course, they're not really watching, they haven't got eyes, so how do they detect pathogens then? Well, this just think about it. How would you go about detecting a pathogen? If you had to decide from, you know, a hundred trillion human cells, and you have to suddenly detect whether this cell that you've got in front of you is a human cell or whether it's a pathogen cell, how would you do that? Well, the obvious thing to think of is that potentially the pathogen cell has some sort of molecule that it makes or maybe secretes and puts on its cell surface uh, that no human cell would ever, ever make, okay? So if the pathogen cell makes some sort of molecule that uh, human cells would never, ever dream of making, then that's a giveaway sign that this cell is not a human cell, but is instead a pathogen cell. Now, there is an umbrella term for all of these molecules uh, which pathogens make, which human cells would never ever make, and this is to call them all pathogen-associated okay, molecular patterns. And because pathogen-associated molecular patterns is a bit of a mouthful, this is often abbreviated to the initials P A. MPs for short, PAMPs, so Pathogen Associated Molecular Patterns. So if this microbe here makes some molecule, let's say, that no human cell would ever, ever make, okay, and the archetypal example is that gram-negative bacteria make a molecule known as LPS. Okay, where should I jot this down? So this is LPS. Yes, let's say, uh, which stands for lipopolysaccharide, and this is the molecule that no human cell would ever have on its cell surface. And well, so in fact, these gram-negative bacteria, they don't just make the LPS, they actually stick it on their surface as well. So this is a molecule that no human cell in its right mind would ever put on its cell surface. So this is a giveaway sign that this is not a human cell. Okay, so, um, Basically, there are loads of other molecules. LPS is the kind of archetypal example that people give, but there are loads of them, basically, that can be used to decide that this, um, this cell or structure, you know, viruses aren't cells, but they're still a sort of structure, let's say, uh, that this structure is not human. Okay, so then what needs to happen is these sentinel cells need to have a way of detecting this pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So they have receptors for pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And again, these receptors are all uh, bundled under an umbrella term, which is, whoops, pattern recognition receptors. Okay, pattern recognition receptors. And those are called PRRs for short. So, for short, we use PRR to denote a pattern recognition receptor. Okay, uh, so these are receptors for specific PAMPs. So, 
Don't get me wrong, there isn't just one pattern recognition receptor which will detect all PAMPs. No, you have loads of different pattern recognition receptors all over these um, sentinel cells, these dendritic cells, these resident macrophages, and these mast cells. And they will uh, bind their ligand, which will be some sort of PAMP, uh, and uh, that will activate the sentinel cell. So, to use our uh, specific example of LPS, the pattern recognition receptor for LPS is a receptor known as Toll-like receptor 4, or TLR4. So this stands for Toll-like receptor 4. So T is for Toll, L is for like, and then R is for receptor, and then 4 is for 4. Okay, so Toll-like receptor 4 is the specific pattern recognition receptor that these uh, resident, well, these sentinel cells, whether they be resident macrophages, dendritic cells, or mast cells, will have on their surface. Now, if some pathogen comes foolishly into our tissue bearing this LPS, LPS will bind to the toll-like receptor 4 and will cause activation of that receptor, which will lead to activation of the sentinel cell. So whether it be a dendritic cell, a resident macrophage, or a mast cell, it will become activated. And the same principle goes for general PAMPs binding to their pattern recognition receptor. Okay, and what will then happen is these molecules, sorry, these cells will start sending out panic signals, basically. So, the dendritic cells and the resident macrophages start sending out two pro-inflammatory cytokines. And the two pro-inflammatory cytokines they start releasing are interleukin-1, okay, abbreviated to IL-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, abbreviated to TNF alpha. And these molecules are so important that they deserve their names writing out at least once. This is interleukin-1, okay? And this is tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now, uh, I should just add something regarding tumor necrosis factor alpha that often people will just call tumor necrosis factor alpha tumor necrosis factor, or TNF. Now, this is not because there are not other tumor necrosis factors. There are other tumor necrosis factors. There is tumor necrosis factor beta, for instance, and tumor necrosis factor C is another example. However, these other tumor necrosis factors are nowhere near as important as tumor necrosis factor alpha. So if someone says tumor necrosis factor without clarifying which tumor necrosis factor they're talking about, and you can assume that they mean this most important of all tumor necrosis factors, this tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, so dendritic cells and resident macrophages, when they detect pathogen-associated molecular patterns, which is these um, warning signs that there's a pathogen present, they will be activated and they'll start releasing interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. Meanwhile, when the mast cells detect PAMPs and become activated, they start exocytosing their granules. They degranulate, as it's called, uh, which just means to release their granules. And they, therefore, release histamine. Okay, now, these molecules, these free pro-inflammatory mediators, histamine, interleukin-1, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, are the panic signals. They tell... Um, the um, endothelial cells of the blood vessels that supply this area that something is wrong and that you need to bring in troops to deal with this. Okay, so I've said that um, all the troops that can possibly help us deal with this pathogen are within the blood, so we need to get them out of the blood. So who's responsible for helping us get troops out of the blood, well, it's the endothelial cells which line uh, the microvasculature blood vessels in um, this uh, infected area, okay? Uh, so in the next video, what we'll do is we'll begin with an examination of the different microvasculature blood vessels that you'll have in this area, and then we'll begin to look at how uh, these pro-inflammatory mediators are going to act on them to help, well, to produce this movement of troops from the blood
to the interstitial fluid so that we can fight this pathogen.